I love this feeling. It's a flow position where you kind of make yourself a little bit vulnerable. Um, I won't ask you all to do it now because you'll probably brutally hurt somebody next to you. But it just feels good. Whenever I'm out in the semi-wild, I like just doing this. Oh, seeing in the sunset, yes. But first, I'd like to take a photo of you. Smile. <laughs> that looks good. All right. Why did I do that? Because I made a page on my website. It's going to be there forever. That's my promise to you. A little later today, I'm going to put that photo on this page. It's just under the speaker tab on davecornthwaite.com. And you're going to be able to look back and see this moment forever. What do you want to say? What do you want to have done between now and whenever you go back to that page and look at that photo? Whether it's next year, next week, 5, 10, 20 years, last day of your life. That's what I'm here to talk about today. Now, let's go back to this first shot. I was in Stockholm, Sweden, and I was drying my gear out. I'd been in a kayak for 30 days from Oslo in Norway. This was taken just seven weeks ago. It's an amazing reward, arriving into a city, a place that you'd never been to before, having got there under your own steam. And it's a feeling that I've become addicted to over the last few years. I kayaked for 30 days, almost 600 miles, across Sweden, down the coast, ended up in this amazing, beautiful city. It's a feeling of reward that you can't really get when you drive somewhere, even if it's a long, long way. I really had to work hard to do it. There's this beauty from adventure, a thing that I really love about it, this very act of doing something different, doing something new, doing something that challenges you, doing something that really shapes your view of the world and your place in it. I think it's really important that we sometimes take a step back and assess who we are and what we've done and what our next motives and directions are. And for me, adventure is my way to do that. When I need a break, I go on an enormous thousand mile journey. It's a great time to think. Let's go back to the beginning. How do you become an adventurer? Well, when I was your age, I had no idea what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. There was a lot of noise, a lot of people telling me what I should do. Dave, you should study maths. I hated maths. As you can see, as a small child, I was nothing more than a smooth version of E.T. <laughs> I still have no idea how I fit that tiny little t-shirt over my enormous child head. <laughs> my family is very small, but incredibly loving, typically middle class. My mum, Pauline, is a midwife. Dad is a dentist. And my brother, Andy, is now uh, a jet pilot in the Royal Air Force. But I guess I kind of just lived life by numbers. I didn't really know where I was going or what I wanted. So I ended up going to school, going to university, getting a degree in international development. And then, of course, off the back of that, I got a job as a graphic designer. Standard, right? I woke up on the morning of my 25th birthday. And my cat, Kiwa, she's the one down there. She was on my chest, just kneading my chest, asking for food. And I looked into her big green eyes and realized a couple of things. One, she was about to have a much better day than I was. And that didn't seem fair. And two, I was really depressed. This was the morning of my 25th birthday. You know, it's a big moment, like a quarter-life crisis even though our kind of normal mortality rate is only about 85 or 90. Doesn't quite fit, does it? I realized that there were four anchors to my life that were absolutely crucial to my identity right then. I had a house, I had a well-paid job, I had a long-term girlfriend, that's not her real face, <laughs> and I had a cat. On paper, I was a successful Western adult, but I realized that morning that the only one of those four things that I dearly loved was the cat. I know, but if it's true, it's true, and you have to act on it. I had to trust my gut. I didn't want to live this same life for the next few years, so I got on with it. I started thinking about what it was that needed to change. I wanted to live a life according to how I feel. I wanted to wake up with passion, looking forward to each day. I definitely didn't, mainly because I was a rubbish graphic designer. <laughs> Someone had just seen fit to pay me in order to produce bad graphic design work. This couldn't go on if I was going to fulfill my potential. So, I got a skateboard. I'd never done it before. 
I love that feeling of riding around a town, just the perspective that I had of a place I'd lived in for six years changed just because I was traveling around it in a different way. Two weeks after stepping onto that board, I skated into work, put my keys on the desk, and quit my job. And I made myself a promise, I'm going to skate further than anyone else has ever skated. It was the sanest decision of my life. I know it sounds crazy, but it changed my life because I just did it. I warmed up by going from John O'Groats to Land's End, 896 miles, and then a couple of months later, in August 2006, I flew to Perth, Australia, and skated for 156 days across that enormous hot country. I know what you're thinking, you're a ginger, you've got red hair, you definitely shouldn't go to one of the hottest countries in the world <laughs> and travel in a way without shelter, but I did it. <laughs> so, what came next? I guess I found myself well, wondering, one, okay, I've just broken the world distance record for skateboarding. Why is it that all Australia seems to care about is the size of my right calf? <laughs> I was a beginner when I started, so I only pushed with one leg. To be fair, it was a really, really, really big right calf. This still isn't working, so the timing's all off. <laughs> See? And that's real size, that's life size. <laughs> The next journey happened a couple of years later. I spent some time just trying out new things. I knew I didn't want to go back to graphic design, to that life that just was full of monotony, something I knew that I had to avoid. And it took me about three years of trying these new things. I set up a business called Chilled Turtle. It was a dramatic failure, but that's okay because in this process, in this two and a half, three years of trying new things, I realized that it was okay to fail because you learn way more from your failure than your successes. And quite often before I got on my skateboard, I knew that I might fail something and therefore I didn't take it on. Slowly knocking out that fear of failure meant that I could just carry on and act on every one of my decisions. I knew that adventure was something that I really loved, being outside, living simply, everything that I needed to work, rest, live and play, I could carry in my kayak. So. I went to Australia and took on my second big adventure. I kayaked from source to sea along the Murray River. And next slide, please. And uh, it taught me so much. One, I just fell in love with traveling on water. And also I realized that I was probably packing a little bit too much. <laughs> Thank you, Dina. <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> After, after this journey on the kayak, I realized that I didn't really have much focus. I knew now that it was adventure that I really wanted to pursue as a lifestyle, as a career. I loved everything that I got from it. But it was quite difficult for me coming back off a journey where every single day for months on end had been full of color and vibrancy. Afterwards, when I came home to somewhere familiar, life seemed just a little bit gray. So I needed something that would keep my focus. And I always recommend, if you guys feel like you're in a rut at some point, then make a bucket list, a yes list, a life list, whatever you call it, but get a piece of paper and just write a big list of things that you love to do, and then follow it. It becomes part of your identity, and everything on there is based on your passion. I came up with my own. It's called Expedition 1000. The idea was to do 25 different journeys, each one a minimum of 1,000 miles in distance, and each one using a different form of non-motorized transport. I'd done two already, the skateboard and the kayak. So, let's just look forward now. I've only got 22 of these to go. I met an Australian guy called Sebastian Terry. He was actually traveling around the world doing his own list. It was called 100 Things, and Seb and I got on really well. He'd already done a bunch of stuff like crashing the red carpet at the, film fest, at the Cannes Film Festival, and um, what else did he do? He skydived naked, which was really uncomfortable, I think, for the French man he was attached to. <laughs> <laughs> Seb had done loads of these things, and you know when someone's really living their life by their own choices, by their own line, because their eyes just shine, they're full of passion. We got on really well, and we decided that we'd ride a tandem bike from Vancouver to Vegas. It was really cool, 1,400 miles, and the first time I, any of us sat on a tandem bike was when the journey began. We made it. Next slide, please. I think also... This idea of uh, just glamour of adventure isn't always true. There's quite a lot of monotony in the day-to-day -day plod. And this, you know, this was a joy. Getting a drink, lying back up against a gas station wall, just having a rest for 30 minutes. It was just lovely. So that's three journeys down. Someone gave me a stand-up paddleboard, and within 10 seconds I thought, I need, 
I need to travel a thousand miles plus on this. Within a few months, I was going down the Mississippi River. It starts just a meter wide and a foot deep and just grows into this huge, majestic waterway, one of the most famous in the world. After 82 days and 2,404 miles, I made it into the Gulf of Mexico, breaking the world Guinness record for the longest journey by stand-up paddleboard, which is still a little weird to me because I could have just sat on my board and at some point the river would have just spat me out further than anyone else had ever paddled. <laughs> okay. So, this isn't an advert for Apple, the ease of products, even though <laughs> he did take a photo of himself. <laughs> I show you this picture because I just want to emphasize something that I think is really important. We are special. We're the only creatures on this planet who are capable of long-term forward thinking, aspiration, and ambition. And if you couple that with the fact that every time you do something new, you grow and develop, wouldn't it be a shame if we wasted that potential? really finding out who we could be. So, the journey continued, and this had really become a much bigger journey than just these individual trips. I met a girl called Emily, and she had a big 72-foot sailing boat. You may see it in about an hour's time. We sailed across the Pacific with a great group of people, and I think the very essence of that journey was just about getting away from all these pressures that land delivers to us, having to charge your mobile phone, going shopping, all of this stuff. We just had time to sit on this tiny little floating dot in the middle of an enormous ocean with finite resources. It kind of echoes our position on Earth in the universe. And when you realize exactly how small and insignificant you are, it just takes the pressure off. It's a lovely, lovely feeling. When I came home, a journalist asked me just to supply one photo, one photo to sum up the entire experience, and that's so difficult. But by then I'd realized, I think that final spell on the boat had really helped me to understand exactly who I was and what my motives were. So I sent this photo in, not because it's kind of all, you know, master and commander, very majestic, but I realized that I just wanted to have fun. I want to make the most of every single moment I have, and it's great because this photo has been in lots of different magazines and no journalist or photo editor has ever realized or brought up the question, were you playing a joke on the photographer that morning? Why are some of your fingers substituted by three bananas? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Next up, bike car. I met a guy called Paul Everett and he'd heard about my Expedition 1000 project. This is what happens if you start making a list living by your passion. You talk about it all of the time, it's brilliant. And then people hear about it and they want to get involved too. Paul came up to me and said, I've heard about Expedition 1000, do you want to travel a thousand miles by bike car? I shook his hand, I said, yes. What's a bike car? This is a bike car. This is Priscilla. She weighs about a quarter of a ton. It's basically a bicycle that desperately wants to be a car. You sit at the front and pedal. I did so from Memphis to Miami in late 2012. It wasn't brilliant after just four hours when a car hit us at 80 miles an hour and we ended up 30 meters off the road. I think the big lesson from that, apart from please don't text when you're speeding, is it was a big decision getting back on the bike car. I knew that this could be a mortal journey. I realized just how limited my life was at that point, but I did get back on and I had an amazing trip. My parents got me some swimming goggles for Christmas and I thought I'd better use them well. So I jumped into the Missouri River in late 2012, having never swum more than 100 meters in my life before. 58 days, most of them spent 12 hours in the water. Later, I climbed out of the river in St. Louis, Missouri. That was a tough one. Then loads of stuff just happened. I rode an elliptical bicycle from Liverpool to Nice. Uh, earlier this year, I was on a tricycle with a sail called a wike across the Atacama Desert, the driest place on the planet in Chile. And then after that, I went to a non-motorized transport show, show in Germany, and I was surrounded by, well, it was just heaven for me. So without really knowing I was going to do a journey, I just said on Facebook, guys, pick something that's at this show. At this show. On the Monday, I opened an envelope. They'd chosen another type of tricycle. I got on it and rode a 1,000 miles back to England. Why not? No planning, no nothing. Things just work out. There's lots of other projects in between these bigger adventures. Uh, 50 ways to make 50 pounds is one of them. It's not only this opportunity to find out how other people uh, live and work, but also to give myself some skills and also a reminder that there are so many different ways to make money. Never feel like you're trapped just because you have an income. This is a cool project. First of January 2011, I took a selfie, and I know you're like, 
this guy takes a lot of selfies. Every single day I wanted to take a selfie, and for th after a thousand days I wanted to make a, a short film, half a minute, which just showed the changing progress of my face, but actually what became important was what was over my shoulder. So that's when a new book came out. I was on the Mississippi River, down at the bottom there. That's the day of my granddad's funeral. Every single one of these shots is a little gateway into my memory bank for that day, who I was, who I was with, where I was, and how I was feeling, if you guys wouldn't mind. Uh, I haven't turned my phone off. I know I'm naughty, but I'd love you guys just to be today's memory. Just smile again. That's lovely. Thank you. Next slide. <laughs> So now I run another uh, clothing label. It's called Say Yes More. Uh, it's a brilliant message, and uh, it's all about seizing life, taking opportunities. A lot of people say, why don't you say no more? What? Did you ever, ever get anywhere by saying, yes, I'm not going to do that? Yes is about moving forward. No just stops you in your tracks. It's all about taking life by the scruff and living it. So this most recent journey, paddling, on a kayak, actually not paddling, pedaling, two feet all the way across, look. And then here's Patrick, a guy I met, he's taking a selfie with his feet, he was born with no arms. And I think Patrick would be the first to say, you know, sometimes we wait for some trauma to happen in our lives, the diagnosis of an illness, an accident to happen, but we don't have to wait for that moment. You can start now, you can start making a difference now. So, here we are, we made it. Every single trip I do, it just reinvigorates me. It reminds me who I am. And I think the very key to living is just to make life memorable and to say yes more. Thank you.